King Dane must fall back to the city of Dale and make his stand there. Hey there guys, Nordic Warrior here, welcome back to my video game review series. Today we're going to be looking at another Lord of the Rings video game, Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle Earth 2. This is going to be for the Xbox 360 version. Now, personally I never played the PC version of Battle for Middle Earth 2, and I'm sure most of you are going to consider that the superior version of the game, but I never played that version so I can't really comment on it. Nonetheless, the Xbox 360 version of the game is the version I got when it came out and it's a game that I go back to from time to time, and I've actually really wanted to review this game for quite a while. So the game is a Total War style RTS strategy game, of course based on the Lord of the Rings universe. Before I go any further with this game, just a little backstory about it. So, like most Lord of the Rings games from the time, the game was published by EA, and the vast majority of the game's popularity was due to its online multiplayer content where you could play against other players around the world in various different types of skirmish battles. Well, unfortunately, when EA ultimately ended up losing the Lord of the Rings license, that led to the online servers for the game being shut down, meaning that you can no longer play the online multiplayer component of the game. Thankfully though, despite the servers being shut down and the multiplayer features no longer being accessible, the game still has a lot of single-player content, and a pretty solid single player experience with lots of features and several modes. First of all you get two training tutorials, these tutorials do a great job at introducing you to the game's basic controls and mechanics. You learn how to build a camp, how to train and recruit units, and how to delegate orders to them and maneuver them in battle. These battles can be quite overwhelming if you are new to strategy games of this kind, and I think that the tutorials of this game do a really great job at introducing you to this style of gameplay, and giving you the information that you need going forward. You have two separate story campaigns, the good campaign and the evil campaign. In the good campaign you follow the events of the War of the Ring from the perspective of the legendary elven warrior, Glorfindel, who was a fan favourite from the books who was sadly cut out of the movies, and his friend and companion the dwarf Gloin, father of Gimli and former member of Thorin's company from The Hobbit. Both of these characters basically move the story forward and act as the main protagonists in a way. The game takes you through various battles in locations from Middle-earth lore such as Rivendell, the High Pass, Selduin, Dol Guldur, the Grey Havens and even the Lonely Mountain Erebor. These levels are all extremely well designed and unique in their own way. For example, some levels have you clearing out enemy territory such as the High Pass or the Etten Moors which have both been invaded and taken over by goblins and trolls, or you will have to defend certain territories such as the Grey Havens, where you are introduced to the game's naval mechanics. That's right, in addition to ground battles, you even have naval battles where you have to construct various different types of ships and take out the enemy ships or my personal favourite level in the entire game, Erebor, where you take control of King Dane and his army of dwarves, and have to defend Erebor and the city of Dale from waves and waves of Mordor orcs and Easterlings. That level is absolutely fantastic, and like I said before, it's my personal favourite level in the entire game. It's one of them levels that you're going to replay over and over again in order to get it right. There's so many different ways to go about it, and defending the Lonely Mountain from the absolute hordes of orcs and easterlings, it's just a really really fun level and I can't recommend it enough. The good campaign culminates in a huge final assault on Sauron's fortress in Mirkwood known as Dol Guldur. Elrond's elven forces as well as the elves of Mirkwood and the dwarves of Erebor, the Blue Mountains and the Iron Hills form an alliance to destroy the forces of Mordor. I love the good campaign and I honestly think they did a great job with it. The evil campaign is quite different, you take control of the forces of Mordor as you aid Sauron in his conquest of Middle-earth, basically wiping out every single good settlement in the north. Some levels you take control of the mouth of Sauron and the Nazgul and follow their path while others you take control of Gorkul the Goblin King and his forces of goblin warriors. 
You come across areas from Middle-earth such as Lorien, Mirkwood, the Grey Havens, Rivendell, and even the Shire. Yeah, this game has you taking over the Shire and slaughtering all the poor hobbits and their Dunedain Ranger protectors in an absolutely brutal and savage display of evil. These levels are far more attack oriented and less defense oriented than the good campaign, which of course you would expect, culminating in a brutal and vicious final assault on Rivendell, with a bit of personal help from the Dark Lord Sauron himself, who by the way is insanely powerful in this game. Both campaigns have their own epic moments and are pretty fun for the most part. Personally, I do prefer the good campaign though, I think it was a little bit more well written and well designed. Another feature you have during these campaigns is the ability to level up your heroes as well as unlock points for combat that you can use to unlock powers. These powers vary depending on how you choose to spend your points. On the good campaign you have powers such as Flood, summoning the legendary Tom Bombadil to kick some orc ass, or even summoning a whole battalion of archers out of nowhere to back you up. On the evil campaign, these powers are even more crazy, allowing you to summon creatures such as the Watcher in the Water, or even the Balrog. You can also summon a dragon and several other creatures from the Middle-earth lore to assist you in battle. Adding to the game's overall replay value, each level in both campaigns usually has several bonus objectives that are entirely optional for you to complete, should you personally choose to do so. The objectives vary from destroying a particular target or protecting one, or perhaps something completely random like obtaining a particular allegiance from some wild creatures, or perhaps even going around and searching for outposts and capturing them all. These are usually not that difficult to achieve, but sometimes they can be quite difficult to find, and if you want to go and gain achievements in the game or unlock certain features, this is probably worth doing. But again, it's entirely up to you, and that's why I like it so much. It just adds to the overall replay value of the game a bit and gives you some more things to do. In addition to the story campaigns, you also have another feature called Skirmish. This allows you to set up and customise your own skirmish battle. Choose your map, your army, as well as the parameters for each battle, such as the difficulty, command point limit, and starting resources. These battles are good for hours more fun and will keep you playing the game long after completing the story campaigns. Whether you want to have an all out battle on an open field, or perhaps defend a stronghold from Middle Earth such as Minas Tirith or Helm's Deep. Helm's Deep is my personal favourite skirmish map because I love watching waves and waves of orcs charge towards my gate only to get blasted away by my fully upgraded archers, but I digress. You also have an optional feature to add to Skirmish if you want to, called One Ring Mode. This adds Gollum to the map, and if you manage to find him, you can slay him, take the One Ring back to your fortress, and use it to unlock a particular hero. He's usually quite difficult to find, but not impossible. And if you're able to get him before the enemy team, gives you a good advantage. When playing as a good army, you can unlock Galadriel, while playing as an evil army, you can unlock Sauron. These two characters are, of course, insanely powerful, and, of course, having either one of them on the battle is going to give you a huge tactical advantage, giving you an incentive to acquire the One Ring for your army in a skirmish battle. Overall, these skirmish battles are fantastic, and there is so much fun to have with them. Another feature the game has is heroes. Certain objectives can be completed that will unlock a new hero for you that can be used in a skirmish battle, What's really cool about this is that some of these unlockable heroes are from another Lord of the Rings game, The Third Age, which I recently reviewed. Link in the description if you want to check that out. Heroes such as Berathor, who of course was the protagonist in The Third Age game, Idriel, Morwen, and even the dwarf Hadhod, as well as several others, some evil, some good. So all in all, the game is a masterpiece, a true timeless classic, and even without the online modes, the game is still worth buying for its single player experience and features. I give Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle Earth 2 a solid 9 out of 10, a truly great game with a lot of replay value. The only real criticisms I have for it is that sometimes the AI is pretty bad, not always but sometimes, and occasionally the frame rate slows down when there are a lot of units and characters on screen. But these are just some minor nitpicks, you know, just some small issues and I really don't think they're worth complaining about. I would still recommend the game nonetheless. 
to any fan of strategy games, and certainly to any Lord of the Rings fan like myself and lots of others. Thanks for watching guys, stay tuned for my next review where I'm planning to look at the final Lord of the Rings game to be published by EA, Lord of the Rings Conquest. If you guys are interested, stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching and God bless.